From the Watson Institute at Brown University, this is Trending Globally. I'm Sarah Baldwin. Whether we're talking about the elections, the pandemic, racial justice, or climate change, it feels like one idea kept coming up this year. The line of cause and effect between national and local politics runs both ways. What the federal government does affects individuals and communities, and what individuals and communities do can change the national conversation. On this episode, we looked at that theme in the context of our home state of Rhode Island. I talked with Dan McGowan, a political reporter for the Boston Globe who covers Rhode Island. Talking with Dan wasn't just a look into one of the country's more colorful political scenes. It also felt like a real-time illustration of the value of local news to understanding our society. We talked about the pandemic response in Rhode Island, the leftward tilt of our state house in the 2020 elections, and the importance of local journalism to our big, sprawling country. We started by looking at one Rhode Islander who recently jumped into the national spotlight, former governor and now Commerce Secretary under Joe Biden, Gina Raimondo. I asked, for folks outside the Ocean State who don't know her, what should they expect from their new Commerce Secretary? Here's Dan. I mean, look, I think Gina Raimondo is, for folks who, who have maybe aren't that familiar with her, she's very much cut from that moderate, pro-business Democrat class, right? She's much more Michael Bloomberg than she is AOC. And in fact, she endorsed Michael Bloomberg for president for the short run that he had. And so, you know, she makes a lot of sense, I think, on the commerce side. Traditionally, if you look at many of the folks who have had this job, um, certainly in recent times, uh, you know, look back to the Obama administration, Penny Pritzker, um, she, those two are very good friends, you know, moderates who are going to, you know, fit in well with, uh, I think, some of the, the Wall Street crowd that might have some concerns about the Biden administration kind of moving to the left, but somebody who who's also, you know, knows how to get things done as an executive. Remember, the Commerce Office is massive. We're talking 40,000 employees, a 13 some odd billion dollar budget. It's larger than the state of Rhode Island, the budget, right? And she's somebody who has proven, I think, as governor that she can navigate politics relatively well. Rhode Island's a very blue state, and she was able to, you know, win as a moderate Democrat here, um, and then kind of curve to the left in general elections to, to um, you know, fit to, to kind of meet that base. And so she knows what she's doing when it comes to that stuff, but then she's also somebody who kind of soothes the needs of Joe Biden's wealthier donors and certainly the Wall Street crowd. Right. And she's a former venture capitalist, so she's she's quite friendly to business. Yeah, that's absolutely right. She, um, you know, comes from that world. And I think you saw, I think it actually scored her some points with um, some of the Republicans, even some of the Democrats on the Senate committee. Let's just put it clearly, she's not a political hack, right? She doesn't come from a world where she's been, you know, just climbing the ranks of Rhode Island government forever or Congress or whatever. She got into this for a very specific reason. She ran for treasurer to reform the state's pension system. It's not sexy, but it was really important. She was able to, to you know, pull that off and it got her on this, you know, fast track to be the governor. But she she certainly has always had a, a, a very, you know, pro-business sense. She, if you look in Rhode Island, um, she helped to recruit a lot of companies to this day. She kind of always approaches everything with, an, you know, this economy first mind state. Well, let's talk about how she's dealt with the COVID-19 pandemic. I wonder if there are any lessons that we learned in Rhode Island that, that other states might take away. Specifically, there's a big New York Times story recently on her handling of school openings including when that idea was very unpopular and before she had CDC data that bore out her decisions. So based on her ability to convince people, 70% of Providence parents sent their kids to school in October when a lot of schools would have preferred to stay closed. So I wonder if it's a case study for kind of how public schools and state leadership might work together. Yeah, it's a really good question, Sarah. The the thing that's interesting is it's a great segue from the conversation about the Commerce Office and her kind of commitment to um, restoring the economy. Because make no mistake about it, her decisions on Rhode Island schools were directly related 
to the economy. She made some decisions, you know, about reopening schools across Rhode Island, not just Providence, across the state, you know, before she had pretty solid data. Now, there was some good international data, but before she had solid data in the United States, in large part, because in her eyes, you have a lot of parents who needed to get back to work. And in the only way to be able to kind of reopen the economy, or the one key factor was getting kids back to school. So you didn't have a parent stuck at home, things like that. The key, my colleague, uh, Bianca Torres and I did a, a story a, a while ago, right as school was reopening, to compare the Massachusetts and Rhode Island reopenings, because it was very different. Massachusetts took this approach to kind of leave it in the hands of different school districts. The unions certainly, as they do here, had a ton of influence. And what we decided, you know, as we reported it out, was one of the big differences, and this is what you see in that New York Times article too, is Governor Raimondo took a very top-down approach. They were able to convince every district to go with a statewide school calendar. They were able to um, be very vocal about, we expect you to reopen the schools. This was on TV every day. It was the governor was, you know, constantly having press conferences, reiterating that she felt that students needed to be back in school. And it almost got, I think, the public uh, and I think a lot of school superintendents um, initially really sort of on board. They felt comfortable. And it wasn't even even if they didn't feel comfortable, it was okay, we're going to do this, we're going to make this happen. There was absolute resistance, particularly from, I think, the teachers. But, you know, the governor, I think to some degree, took a bet here. She, you know, rolled the dice a little bit to say, we think this will be okay. And it paid off very clearly because now, as you're seeing across the country, there's a major push from local governments to put students back in classrooms and get teachers back in classrooms. But she was able to um, really kind of grab everything and say, we're doing it my way. And yeah, I think it paid off to some degree. One of her other stated reasons for opening schools was the importance of education So I wonder, there's a new task force to study learning loss among Rhode Island students that the state just convened. And of course, it's too soon to know what the findings are, but do we have any sense of whether that decision means that the results are less dismal than they would have been? And is this something that other states are doing? I think you're going to find, actually, unfortunately, that the uh, results are going to be more dismal than maybe we might have uh, already anticipated. Rhode Island, uh, Governor Raimondo was one of the first governors in the country to shut the schools down. Right. Back in March? Back in March. That's right. When the governor uh, said, I need you guys to come up with this uh, you know, plan for potentially the rest of the year, she didn't announce it initially that it would be the rest of the year, but she said, you know, we need to we need to have plans. Every district and the teachers unions, to their credit, came on board very quickly. Every district came up with a plan. And sure enough, the kids never returned to school for the rest of that school year. Um, and so the governor was was very quick to pull the trigger on that. And, and then everybody, of course, followed suit, which was probably the right idea at the, at the time. Um, but then, you know, I think there was this rush. I was guilty of this at times too, because it felt so smooth. You had, generally speaking, people praising the state's ability to dramatically overhaul education in a week, basically. And then she started to actually, you know, hear from parents. Uh, You know, they didn't do statewide standardized testing last year because it would have come sort of in May or April or May and they were already out of school. But you started to hear those kind of anecdotal stories. Hey, my kid, you know, logs into class, but they're also playing Xbox on the side all day long, right? Things like that. And she started to get a little bit worried about it. Meanwhile, I think a lot of national experts uh, were starting to say, this is going to be a major problem. You know, you can't have an entire, essentially a half a school year with kids out of school um, and not expect this to, you know, set them back, right? I mean, it's not just academically. It's if you're six years old, you're learning to socialize with other kids, things like that. And so I think she started to realize, okay, this is going to be more of a problem. I think there wasn't a ton of data. There wasn't any evidence yet that that anyone had lost learning. But then you, you know, you go an entire summer, then you kind of push things into late September instead of early September. 
and you're you're suddenly very nervous. I think in her case, I think she was very nervous about, you know, what happens if this is another lost school year? The jury is still out on this. Look, they're back in school, but as we all know, school is not what it was before the pandemic. So I think folks are, are learning on the fly in many ways. And that's educators, that's administrators, and certainly that's students. And now what the state is trying to do is understand, okay, what did it actually mean? How, how much did we set kids back? Because we know there's there's all kinds of evidence over the years that's been done, particularly for poor kids, um, particularly, in, I think, in urban communities, that summer learning loss is a dramatic challenge. If kids were losing even more, potentially we have a, a scenario where a kid who, think about those pivotal ages, I don't know, fifth grade, kind of didn't have much of a fifth grade you got into middle school and it was very strange. Suddenly you're going to be, if we think the fall, you're going to be in the seventh grade and you're going to have had basically two years of school interrupted. Um, that could be a real, real challenge. And so what this task force that the state uh, has, has convened with was some real players on it. You know, the former secretary of education, uh, John King, the former Massachusetts secretary, Paul Revel, who, you know, is notorious for, uh, you know, really leading the Massachusetts rebound of education. Um, they're all on this task force and they're going to help, I think, Probably dissect some data and you know try to come up with what what do they need to invest in next? Is Rhode Island sort of an outlier because of its small size? Is it more nimble? Are, are governors able to do more here than elsewhere? I would say the the size of Rhode Island makes it much easier. I will say we have a lot of parochial leaders who who do not want the state putting the thumb on the scale of local, you know, school systems and things like that. Um, and there was some bristling. There's no question about the governor. She called out publicly during, pre- you know, live televised press conferences and really went after them, accused them of letting down kids, of throwing in the towel. Um, and I think she intelligently and accurately um, managed the trust in her during this pandemic and was able to, you know, force kind of parents to push their local uh, leaders to kind of come to the table and figure this all out. And for the most part, that worked. But there's no doubt. I mean, I don't think that you, even a, a state the size of Massachusetts, let's say, which isn't, you know, massive, but it's much larger, it would have been very difficult for Governor Baker uh, especially a Republican, even if even if he's a more moderate Republican, to be able to come in and say, hey, you're going to do it my way or the highway and uh, teachers unions, you know, you're going to have to deal with it. Uh, it. It was much easier for the governor to kind of manage. Really, there are only two there are two statewide teachers unions. She could handle the leadership there, cut some deals, you know, work on some things. It was mu- it's much more streamlined because it's a smaller state. Thinking about, you know, how the federal government has responded to this pandemic and and the economic crisis and how states can respond, you know, what they're able to do. You've written that Dan McKee, the incoming governor, is facing a more than $500 million budget shortfall for the fiscal year beginning July 1st. So how are policymakers in, in the state viewing um, their ability to help people right now? Like, what can they do? This isn't going to be a very satisfying answer, but the, the answer is they're praying that the Biden administration comes through. You know, here we, we have uh, pretty good leadership in Washington with a small delegation, but, you know, Jack Reed, uh, our senior senator, is a, is a real player and on the Appropriations Committee, and, and, you know, now he's the, you know, head of defense. They were able to get, I think, $1.2 billion in that first round of uh, stimulus. And so that certainly helped. Helped. Um, but if you're a policy thinker here, you're listening to that and you're saying, wait a minute, what, but what are they doing otherwise? And, you know, this is going to be a real challenge this time around. You nailed it. $500 million, uh, you know, projected shortfall. We should put that into some context. Um, without the stimulus money last year, Rhode Island generally had, had about a $10 billion budget. Ends up being more because of some of the, the federal money that came flowing. But generally speaking, we're talking $10 billion. And so, you know, 500 million on 10 billion is, is pretty significant. And so, 
this is something that the legislature still, you know, we're, we're only in February right now. They've only kind of recently gotten back into session. So I think they're trying to explore it. I would say I wouldn't expect dramatic uh, changes knowing this legislature, sort of knowing the way leadership thinks here. There may be a push to uh, increase taxes on the wealthy, things like that. But there's just as much of a push on the other side that would say, you know, no, why would you raise taxes at a time when unemployment's through the roof and we're trying to re- reboot the economy? There's all kinds of debates to be had about that. But truthfully, the legislature tends to think in terms of th- sort of the dollars of cents of what their constituents say. And your average constituent's going to tell you they don't want any any changes to their taxes. That's what they tell the local governments, so, you know, when it comes to property taxes. And that's the same way at the state level. I want to think back to um, last fall and the primaries in 2020. There were big progressive wins for for the state of Rhode Island. You know, we think of ourselves as a blue state, but our Democratic leaders are often not very blue um, in practice. And so I wonder what those wins say about politics in in our state and what effect it might have on politics and policy going forward. Yeah, it's the number one question. Uh, if there were no, if we were to pretend there was no pandemic to be dealing with, I think the number one issue um, in Rhode Island right now would be what are the, you know, progressives going to do, um, with some of their big gains in the legislature, particularly the Senate. Um, there were some major victories from brand new people who, one case in Providence, knocked out a, you know, 30 year some odd incumbent. So there are lots of new progressives, uh, and you have now, you know, there a 38 member chamber in the Senate. You have, I don't know, 10, 15 probable pretty strong progressives now. And, uh, and so not enough to change leadership, I should say. The, the leadership remains pretty conservative on the Senate side. And so you still do have, I think, very moderate to conservative control. But what, what happened last fall in our Democratic primaries is, uh, for the first time in a really long time, I think you saw progressives very strategically pick vulnerable incumbents, win, start to build their bench. And I think two years from now, uh, you know, you're, you're going to have a very similar push. In fact, you might have more because you're going to, it's a, for us, it'll be a statewide election year. You have everybody on the ballot. Providence mayor, certainly the governor, all that. Um, and so in Democratic primaries, just like many other places in the country, the left has outsized influence and that is, that is real here too. And so, um, I think you can see, you potentially will see more. And to use the Senate as a really good example, you're only talking about tipping the scale just a little bit three or four more wins for progressives and suddenly you have complete chaos in the Senate when it comes to legislative leadership. You will completely have, uh, you know, a new group of uh, folks in there. You know, I think that's what they're really, I think that's what the progressives are eyeing. They're, They're playing the long game here, had great success in 2020 could very well have good success in 2022 and, and really could be setting at the table for a major, major changes, I think, in, in Rhode Island government. What do you think the likelihood of Rhode Island ever having, um, I'll just say the, the pandemic has, you know, really revealed the abysmal state of, of housing instability and affordable housing in the country and, and Rhode Island is no different. What do you think the likelihood, if things continue in this way, the way you just described, do you think that we'll ever have a line item in the budget for affordable housing? I think you will have a line item for affordable housing in the budget um, if nothing were to change at all. Uh, I think that's coming this year. I think it's a priority in the case of, if you look at the Senate leadership, uh, the Senate president, Dominic Ruggiero, is a longtime labor leader, you know, was a very big wig in that circle. And what does, you know, a, for, a line item for affordable housing mean? Building, right? It, it means something for the trades. And so and that's not to say they're not supportive at all of, of why it is good policy to do this, but 
you know, they're very much thinking about this as a, a jobs creator as much as a, you know, affordable housing addresser. And so I think you will see that very quickly. The question is going to be, you, you tend to see, I, I think we've seen this in other states around the country when it comes to affordable housing. And, and you know, you, you often see big cities take this on. Boston's been good at this, although they certainly could be better. I think New York, you're, you, you see some effort in this. You know, at the state level, it, the question is going to be how much, right? And it'll probably start off relatively small and be unsatisfying. Um, but once it's in the budget, boy, I'd hate to be on the ballot and say that I, I cut, I cut affordable housing once it's in there. So once you get it in there, you can chip away, you can get more going. So I think that's the way to do it. Dan, I want to ask you, you're, you're a reporter for the globe and your beat is an entire state, which is pretty cool. I just wanted to hear your thoughts on why the globe thinks it's important to cover Rhode Island and why local reporting in, in general is important and probably the biggest cheerleader for local reporting that that there is um i am bullish on the future of local reporting which some folks are not i think that there is um real opportunity particularly in places like providence is a good example but you know any of the the larger let's say top 100 television markets in the country or metro markets in the country where you might be seeing a local newspaper, your traditional newspaper of record, go out of business, go out of print, things like that. But we're really fortunate in this moment because of the internet and because suddenly you're, you're able to kind of, I think, make a little bit more money on the web than you were maybe 10 or 15 years ago. And so you have lots of really interesting experiments happening. You have Axios uh, starting to break into local um, reporting. You have Plenty of nonprofits, the Vermont Digger, the Voice of San Diego, um, you know, bunch of different companies that are um, doing really important uh, journalism that in some ways replaces the the traditional newspaper of record. And I think there's such an opportunity for local television to get a little more serious about covering the nitty gritty of, you know, state houses and city halls and, um, you know, what's really happening in these places as opposed to, you know, the traditional sort of we're just going to cover the top line stuff, too much crime, too much weather, things like that. And we saw it here in Providence. CBS Ch- Channel 12 um, invested in in some really strong digital reporters. When I was there, I covered Providence and, and sort of owned that beat. My colleague Ted Nisi covered the State House. And we also did a lot of other things, healthcare, education. And suddenly you become a pretty dominant player in the market. And then to your question of why the Globe did Rhode Island, it wasn't something that was um, a giant plan originally. The truth is, Two years ago, um, I got a call from the editor of the Globe, Brian McGroy, and he said, hey, we're thinking about coming to Rhode Island. What should we know? I told him I thought this was a place that could use another, you know, major player. And the Globe certainly counts as that. It's one of the biggest newspapers in the country. What we really wanted to do with, with Rhode Island was not do the let's replace the Providence Journal thing. We don't feel that way at all. Um, we, you know, we certainly want to compete with the journal and with the television stations and everybody else. We feel like we can come in and, you know, have thoughtful daily reporting, but talk about big issues. We don't have to cover everything. We don't have to do the stuff that you might get for free on television. Doesn't mean it's not good or not, or, or anything like that. It just means I think the way people consume news is they have multiple um, ways to consume it. You can get it certainly on Twitter and all that stuff. You still can watch TV. Um, and, you know, I think we can fill a little bit of a void to be very deep, to really tackle complicated issues. Um, and it's really nice to be a part of a place that that I've grown up in. This is a it's a place I love. I think it's there's a lot of news. It's a great news place, right? It's there's always something crazy happening in Providence. There's always, you know, a fun political race to cover. And the Globe, you know, sees Providence as a as a test market. In a few weeks we'll have uh six full time reporters and one editor here in Rhode Island. So, you know, a seven person staff uh, it doesn't get you all the way. It doesn't get you to cover the entire state, but it, it really does check a lot of boxes. I think we're going to be, make a real impact. And the big question is, what does the globe do from here? Do we, um, do we potentially go try to do this in Worcester or Hartford, Connecticut? Um, and I think those are things that are, are certainly on the table. You know, I think just like in Providence, there's an ability to fill a void, um, all over the region. 
I want to ask you just to break down um, the place where we started, and that is, what is the importance of local news? As a citizen, what do I lose when I lose my newspaper? It's a really great question. I mean, the number one thing is you lose sort of the connection to your community that, um, that, a, that a newspaper in particular can, can kind of provide, right? Newspaper traditionally in a, in a local market or in a local community is going to cover, you know, the tax rate and the school board. But you know what it's also going to do? It's going to publish the honor roll. It's going to publish, you know, the, the youth basketball league scores, right? You know, I think local newspapers have the unique ability to really bring people together. But then most importantly is the work that I feel like certainly I try to do every day is is tell people what's really happening, how your money is being spent, holding officials accountable. Um, those are the, the key drivers to what a good local newsroom is. And, you know, I'd love to believe the Globe is, is pulling that off. Dan McGowan, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. This episode was produced by Dan Richards and Alina Coleman. Our theme music is by Henry Bloomfield. Additional music by the Blue Dot Sessions. I'm Sarah Baldwin. If you haven't yet, you should definitely subscribe to Dan McGowan's free newsletter from the Boston Globe, Roadmap. We'll put a link to it in the show notes. And if you like us, leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Or if you have a friend who you think would like the show, tell them about it. We'll be back next week with another episode of Trending Globally. Thanks. 